Stephanie Costallo is the Vice President of the U.S. Institute Against Human Trafficking, a national nonprofit faith-based organization working to end human trafficking in the United States. During her time at the U.S. Institute, Stephanie has helped create and scale the, the Trafficking Free Zone Program, a county-level initiative focused on reducing the demand for sex trafficking. Stephanie has led the program driving cities, counties, and organizations to declare themselves trafficking free zones, directed thousands of online sex buyers towards resources to get help, implemented law enforcement, training at police departments across the nation, and trained thousands of community members on human trafficking awareness. In addition to her work at the U.S. Institute, Stephanie serves as the vice chair of the Pasco County Commission on Human Trafficking and as an advisory board member of the post 9-11 veterans nonprofit community organization, as she is a veteran herself, having served in the United States Air Force. Thank you for your service. She is also a published author. Stephanie resides in Florida with her husband and three children. Please give a warm welcome to Stephanie Costello. Alrighty, so thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for being here for the panel discussion today. We have some incredible panelists, so it's your lucky day. You're hearing from some of the key experts in the anti-trafficking industry here in the local area, but also we have a federal perspective as well. So I'll go ahead and read through the bios and then we'll jump into the panel conversation. The point of this is really to educate. You've just seen a film and you, you may have had some human trafficking education already, but the point of this panel is to really drive home what does sex trafficking look like in your community? How prevalent is it? How can you identify it? where to report, how to make a difference essentially, and how you as a community member can prevent the trafficking of your community, uh, men, women, and children. So that's the goal of the panel today. We're gonna go through a list of questions to accomplish that, and we'll open it up to question and answers after we're finished here. So our first uh, panelist over here at the end is Congressman Ted Yoho. Congressman Ted Yoho represents North Central Florida's third congressional district. He was elected to the 113th Congress in November 2012 and won re-election for his fourth term in the 116th Congress. His approach to government is guided by constitutional principles, limited government, fiscal conservatism, personal responsibility, and free enterprise. These principles keep Congressman Yoho focused on supporting bills that help make America strong. Congressman Yoho has been known to stand up and challenge the status quo for the better. In the 115th Congress, Representative Yoho spearheaded the nation's largest reform to foreign aid since 1970 with the passage of the BUILD Act. Prior to serving in Congress, he was a small business owner who operated several large animal vet practices for 30 years. And during his successful career, he's established a reputation of accountability and service. Please help me welcome Congressman Yoho. Chief Greg Graham is next on the line here. He began his career with the Ocala Police Department in 1983. He's worked his way through the ranks as an investigator in the Drug Task Force and in the Special Investigations Unit, as well as Patrol Division Sergeant, Criminal Investigation Sergeant, Captain of the Professional Standards Unit, Major of the Investigative Services Bureau, Major of the Community Policing Operations Bureau. Why get a bit? In February 2002, he was promoted to De Deputy Chief of Police, a position he held until 2008 when he accepted the position of Chief of Police for the Cedar Rapids, Iowa Police Department. And in January 2012, he was appointed as Chief of Police for the Ocala Police Department. Chief Graham has attended many training courses and classes, including the FBI National Academy 188th session in Quantico, Virginia. And in 2004, he received his bachelor's degree in criminology from St. Leo University. Please help us welcome Chief Graham. Next to Chief Graham here, we have Talicia Espinoza, an adult survivor of human trafficking who is now an advocate for all victims of exploitation. She was born and raised in an abusive home in Miami, Florida, and by the age of 16 was living on the streets. 
With little self-worth, she took a job working in a strip club in Miami, and there she met a man who showed her the kind of attention that she had longed for, but before she realized it, Talicia was sold on the street corners across the country. She now travels throughout the U.S. telling the story of God's love, redemption, and hope. Talicia takes her powerful message of how God rescued her from a life of abuse and exploitation to one of freedom and redemption in him. As a voice for the voiceless, she shares her story with transparency and authenticity with the hope that it'll awaken others to the tragedies that exist in their own communities and get involved with local grassroots organizations and local nonprofits. Her compassion to see women and children attain their freedom has enabled her to support and coach victims who are transitioning and in recovery. Talicia's testimony of survival has made her a highly sought after speaker for faith-based organizations, schools, law enforcement agencies, task forces, and victim recovery programs. Please help us welcome Talicia. Allison Angaro is the founder and executive director for Created Gainesville, a local nonprofit organization committed to reaching and restoring lives impacted by sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. She came to Gainesville from the Panhandle to study at the University of Florida, where she earned a bachelor's and graduate degree in speech language pathology. She met her husband while they were students at UF and now have five beautiful children. Allison was a full-time stay-at-home mom when her heart was drawn to the harsh realities for women caught in the sex industry. Paired with her heart being broken for the exploitation of women around the world, including in North Central Florida, her heart was also filled with an overwhelming hope that these women could be set free, healed, and live a life full of dignity, value, and hope. Created Gainesville operates a four-pronged program, including prevention, awareness, outreach, and restoration through a holistic approach program called Creative Care, Created Care, with a focus on opportunities for physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual healing. Please help us welcome Allison. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, directly to the right of me, we have Detective Zachary Hughes. He is a six-year veteran of the 3rd Brigade 82nd Airborne Division as an infantryman. He deployed to Operation Southern Watch, Multinational Force Observers Mission, and Operation Enduring Freedom, on top of numerous local, national, and international training events. He held a variety of duty positions from automatic rifleman to weapon squad leader and unit armor. He is also an Eagle Scout. Currently. He is Deputy Sheriff at the Marion County Sheriff's Office, assigned to the Special Investigations Bureau as a task force officer with the FBI. His passion lies with the Marion County Human Trafficking Task Force. He holds a position on the executive board and serves as one of the lead local level trainers. He once was introduced at the University of Florida as a social justice advocate that just happens to be a cop. In 2014, he was awarded the Bill Rutherford Award for his work on human trafficking prevention in Marion County, and in 2015 was named Detective of the Year, partially due to his work in the field of human trafficking. He's married with three young daughters and has obtained a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and has completed a master's degree in criminal justice specializing in critical incident management from St. Leo University. He's currently writing his dissertation to complete the final requirement for his PhD and public administration from Capella University. Please help us welcome Detective Hughes. Okay, so like I said, a lot of incredibly impressive panelists here to give information on human trafficking here in the area. And so uh, just a brief introduction to the topic of human trafficking. I'd like to just give the federal definition. So for a crime to be considered human trafficking, and we'll probably focus a lot on sex trafficking here, we might be able to touch on labor trafficking somewhat, but primarily we'll be focused on sex trafficking as it pertains to the local area. And so um, the Trafficking Victim Protections Act defines severe forms of trafficking in persons as sex trafficking in which a commercial sex tra act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or if the person is induced to perform such an act, has not attained 18 years of age. So what that means is there's no such thing as a child prostitute, okay? If somebody is under the age of 18 and is performing a, a commercial sexual act, 
which would be anything in exchange for something of value. So a sex act in exchange for money, drugs, a, pill, a place to sleep, food, what have you. If somebody under the 18 is providing a sex act in exchange for anything, that's automatically considered human trafficking. If somebody's over the age of 18 and is engaging in commercial sex acts under force, fraud, or coercion, they then are considered victims of human trafficking. It's important to point that out because um, there's misconceptions that, um, that those under the age of 18 can legally consent to that and they cannot. And I'll touch on one other misconception before we get into the questions. Um, a lot of people believe that to be a crime of human trafficking, there must be movement either across country borders or across state borders or movement of some kind. And so that doesn't always have to be the case. And so it's important to point that out because our goal as community members is to be able to identify if trafficking is happening in our community and then do something about it, right? Prevent it. But unfortunately, identification doesn't always happen because people believe that there has to be movement across borders. And so the crimes of human trafficking and human smuggling are different crimes. Human smuggling is a crime against a border and trafficking is a crime against a person. It does not have to involve movement, although it can and sometimes does. So I just wanted to lay out that misconception there. And with that, we'll get started with our questions. So Chief Graham, when it comes to Ocala and Marion County, how big a problem would you say is human trafficking? Uh, victims, uh, sex trafficking victims who had uh, one that witnessed an overdose and uh, when we got there, it was an overdose death. Um, she clearly was addicted to drugs as well, which is a good, which is a common thing that uh, sex traffickers do. They get you hooked on drugs and then they, they control you even more. We were, we were able to assist her. We've had one where uh, a lady got beat up uh, pretty bad, went to the hospital, was being trafficked. Um, we uh, had officers there, noticed the signs, got her into our amnesty program, our drug amnesty program, and got her some help. So. Uh, just because we live in a small community in a small area, it, it's a it's a big problem. So in, in 2019, Florida had 896 cases reported to the national hotline. 640 of those were sex trafficking. Uh, most of the, uh, it, well, uh, 734 of the victims were female, 125 were male, and uh, 564 were adults, 172 were minors. Um, so it's uh, it's attacking every race, gender, sex, age group, uh, and it is a huge problem here in our area. Allison, what are some common indicators of trafficking that members of the public or our audience should be aware of now that they have an understanding that's happening right here in their community? I would just um, reiterate something that was in the film earlier is that this doesn't just affect one sector of our community, this could impact anyone's family, anyone's child. Um, and so as I answer this, I'm answering it partly with my motherhood hat on and also um, nonprofit world in which I work in. But um, it's something that we all need to take notice of, educate ourselves on what the signs are, know um, what to do if you see that something is not looking right, um, but some of the indicators that we find most common, um, the trend that we see almost 100% of the time is that whether it's an adult or a child is that there is a history of childhood sexual abuse. That is huge. That has to get our attention, um, which is one of the reasons why Created Gainesville is so passionate about providing prevention in our schools so that they can know what uh, maybe they're experiencing that should not be happening to them. Um, have the avenues to put language to maybe what they're experiencing and also have the tools to not only protect themselves but their peers. Some of the things that we educate our community to look out for are sudden changes of appearance or demeanor, um, bruising, tattoos that may look like branding, um, expensive gifts that come out of the blue, excessive time spent with um, older adults, and that can be men and women. I think sometimes that catches people off guard that traffickers can be women. Um, and we've seen many cases of that um, in our area. We also look for signs that an individual does not have control over when they eat, when they sleep, where they go, when they come, when they go, um, those kinds of things. 
And as was addressed earlier, that addiction piece, whether a trafficker uses that in the beginning or whether the drug use becomes intensified, that is a very huge tool that many traffickers use to keep individuals caught, to keep them compliant, um, to keep them dependent. And then that final piece that we see a lot is that isolation. So that person who's trying to kind of cut away any trusted adult that would be protecting, be somebody who would see the signs. Um, so maybe taking their cell phone away, um, encouraging them not to spend time with loved ones and friends, those kinds of things. But I encourage anybody all the time, um, if you see these things, to report them, um, to not take them into your own hands, but to do a collaborative effort and reach out to those that can handle those kinds of investigations in the best way possible. Um, I also just encourage you to not delay. Um, it is so difficult when um, reports come in weeks, months later to go back and get the critical information that's gonna be helpful in an investigation. Um, I think sometimes people shy away from reporting because they're like, what if something's really not happening? I think that goes through all of our minds, right? But the worst thing that happens is that you report and everything's okay, right? Um, if you don't report, the worst thing that happens is that somebody remains in that dangerous situation and they continue to be victimized. Um, so I just encourage you to take um, those risks and report when you see things that do not add up and you see the vulnerability of a young person or an adult. Thank you, Allison. That was a really great overview of what to look for um, to, to understand what indicators of trafficking there are. And you heard her list off several different items. And so there are, there are places that you can get materials that list off some of these indicators. And so it's hard to remember from a panel event, all of the things that you could be looking for that might indicate somebody is being trafficked. And so I'd encourage you, um, perhaps a table I didn't look, but if perhaps a table in the back has a handout. I know Created probably has handouts that list off indicators. My organization, so a simple Google search if you don't find one today. But if, if you do nothing else, I would encourage you to get that list of indicators of potential trafficking and share it with your friends and family so that everybody can have access to that kind of information. So Talicia, although every survivor's experience is unique, what are the most common factors that create vulnerability for sexual exploitation and trafficking? Well, one of the major, um, and it's been spoke about um, a few times today, is a sexual abuse that may be going on in the homes as a young child. Um, my abuse started when I was three. So, you know, as, we become adults, a lot of times those have been those who have been sexually um, exploited, trafficked, have had some kind of sexual abuse. Neglect is a big one. Um, poverty and homelessness. Um, traffickers literally go out and look for those that are homeless and they target them. And those that are living in poverty, a lot of times you'll see that within the labor trafficking also but a lot with the human with the sex trafficking lack of parental guidance or attention my mother was a drug addict and my dad was an alcoholic so there was no attention going to me during my adolescent years all of it was going to themselves and so um, a big one is low self-esteem which is what i had i had no self-esteem whatsoever so anyone and everyone that would show me attention I would gravitate to. And of course, looking for love. I looked for love in all the wrong places. And a lot of these girls that, are, that have been trafficked, and even boys that have been trafficked, were looking for love, um, the love that they didn't get in their homes. Yeah. Um, she made a lot of really great points on what makes somebody vulnerable. And just to touch on that a little bit, um, especially considering the pandemic that's happening right now and how we have more children at home, potentially alone and spending more time online. So that creates a vulnerability as well when we don't have parental guidance over our, our kids that are online. Because as we all probably know in this room, a predator knows everywhere that a young child is going to be online and they're going to go and establish relationships with them in, to try to 
suit their own needs. And so um, I know there have been some statements come out from Nick Mick, the National Center uh, for Child and Exploitation. And they mentioned that because children are spending more time at home online, they're seeing an increase in predatory and traffic or grooming behaviors. So other things to keep in mind. Detective Hughes, is there such thing as a typical victim of trafficking? And what is the age range you typically see for when sex trafficking begins? So over the course of my career, you know, I've, I've been in some interesting places, in my own cases, been involved with other people's cases, um, and assisting or uh, training events or, you know, getting to meet great, courageous people like Talisi and Allison. You know, all these things have occurred. Uh, and at this point, I, there is no typical victim. Um, I have talked to people who are uh, male and female, uh, every race, every color, every religion, whether they're transgender, any LGBTQ+, all of those things. Anybody can be a victim of trafficking, depending on what will make them vulnerable. You know, and we've talked about it. So what is our, you know, our victim profile, you know, it's not like what you see on TV, you know, it's early exposure to domestic violence, early exposure to sexual assault, early exposure to uh, things like uh, drugs and alcohol, uh, running away, exposure to the system. All those things are a better indicator of someone that could potentially be more trapped. That being said, it's not an always. Um, you know, when we worked uh, with Office of Statewide Prosecution to, uh, to prosecute Ryan Poole, a couple of years ago, uh, it was one adult victim case, and by her own admission, she was a Pinterest mom. She was married, had a kid, stable. But when we went back and looked at her history, we did continue to find those things. Early exposure to sexual assault, early exposure to domestic violence, early exposure to drugs and alcohol. Um, and all that led to something. Um, you know, and again, just having talk to these folks, you know, we find these interesting things. Even last week, mean, even Thursday, uh, I was working on something that came in uh, and ran some searches for ads online for the commercial sex industry, just for Ocala. That's the only, that's a search term I'm using, so Ocala. In the last seven days, there was over 2,000. Seven days, 2,000. As part of that, I also ran, you know, one person. Got a series of phone numbers with the investigation and ran them. You know, only one of them popped, and it wasn't a female. It was a male being advertised for sex in the commercial sex industry here in Ocala. A male. And he was advertising to women. Now, I can't say that he's a trafficking victim, but it also tells you that our preconceptions of what buyers look like and what sellers look like has got to be challenged. It is very easy to fall into the trap that buyers are always going to be the overweight white male in a suit that looks like me, <laughs> all right, and a cute little teenage girl, because that's not always the case. Thank you. So, Talicia, do victims of human trafficking self-identify as victims, and do they ask for help? Why or why not? That's a very good question. No. That would be my answer. Most victims do not self-identify for the main purpose and reason is most of them don't even know that they're victims. I didn't know that I was a victim until someone told me years later that I was a victim. And so most of these um, victims do not self-identify. And also, um, I also say no because they're not likely going to ask for help because mainly of four reasons. One is fear, fear of their trafficker, fear of what, um, what might happen to them or a family member, because a lot of times these traffickers will threaten them, um, threaten their family if they don't do what they've told them to do. So fear of the consequences that might take place. Number two, love. I, what we, what we heard and saw on the documentary was one of the pimps are considered a Romeo pimp, which is they'll gain your trust, they want to get to know you, they want to get to know everything about your family and what's going on in your life, exactly what happened to me. And that person grooms you over a few months. Some, it can take sometimes longer than a few months. It can take eight, nine, 10 months for this person to really gain your trust 
and for you to just be loyal to them, which is the next one where I would say would be their loyalty. Loyalty, I put big number one. You see, they, they are down for you. It's just what we say, they're down for you. Like they'll do anything for you, which is what I thought my trafficker would do for me, that he would do anything for me. I later found out that that was not true. But then that caused me to be loyal to him because he took care of me. He took care of my needs. Even though I was the one providing the money, he took care of all the food. He took care of the, the places that we stayed. He took care of the vehicles. Everything that had to pertain to me, he took care of. So I was loyal to him. And number four would be isolation. Allison talked about isolation. Um, they have total control. It is one of their tactics. Um, social, emotional, geographic, financial. He chose where we went, when we went, and how long we stayed there. So he had full control over my life during that time. And most victims are scared to talk to the police, especially if they're brought over from another country. We are groomed, we are taught, we, it's embedded in our memory bank that police are our enemy and we are their enemy. And so that's one of the big things is that they'll keep us isolated from everyone that we know, but also our number one thing is when we come in, come in contact with law enforcement, they're our enemy, we're not to talk to them. And so that's huge. Thank you, Talisa. Yeah, yeah, she just beautifully explained um, why victims don't self-identify as victims of human trafficking, why they don't ask for help. One of the biggest questions that I, I typically get when I give awareness presentations is why don't they run away? Because you haven't heard us say yet that somebody is chained to a bed or handcuffed into a room, right? It's other methods of control. And so when I when I explain that to people, the next question is, why don't they run away if, if they're being treated like this? And Talisa just beautifully explains some of the reasons as to why that is. Congressman Yoho, how can people help reduce vulnerabilities in their community in order to prevent victimization? We started the North Florida Human uh, Trafficking Task Force, I think it was in 2014, and uh, we invited all of our um, city departments, our county, we had state attorneys there, is we had sat down with the DHS in the blue campaign. Have you guys seen that? I assume you talked about that today. This is something, it's, it's through uh, the Department of Homeland Security. They have an awesome program uh, and they have a bunch of material where they can, um, it's, it's stuff you can pass out, but they have a lot of short videos on awareness. I know there's people in here like me. I remember when we bought our first minivan, it was a, uh, we had three kids, we had to have a bigger vehicle. And so we bought a, a Plymouth town and country. It was so pretty. I mean, it was all that because I'd never seen one. But as soon as we drove off the lot, I'm starting to see them everywhere. Women, you might've bought that new Louis Vuitton purse that you're like, man, this is gonna be unique. But once you buy it, everybody has it. That's awareness. And the blue campaign shows it. it's your next door neighbor. It's this person. We had a, a situation in Gainesville about four years ago where there was a businessman, an accountant, that had three women in his house, had them hyped up on drugs, had them dependent on him. He had their loyalty. They were free to leave, but they wouldn't because they were afraid. And um, you know these things are going around everywhere. And so what we can do is the awareness, and the other thing is having metrics. And uh, as we got searching through this situation, of how do you track this in the United States of America? We don't have metrics that is a standard across the nation. So the city of Ocala may have something different than the county of Marion County, which may be different than Gainesville City Police Department. And you see how this gets really complicated? So they may not be reporting these incidences the same. So I personally think it's well, way under reported. We've got a bill that we've introduced to standardize the metrics across the nation so that everybody is reporting the same thing. And I think if we do that and we work awareness like this and get into our schools, K through 12, and I commend Florida for doing that, 
and then also in every u university at orientation, especially in a state like California, Texas, and Florida, but I think all states. And we educate the incoming freshmen at orientation with their parents. And then we have a, a, a repeat of that before spring break. And um, that's just awareness, I think, is the biggest thing we can work on. Absolutely. Thank you, Congressman. Allison, what are some of the effects that trafficking has on an individual who's been trafficked? Um, the, the issues and the implications are very complex. Um, as we heard in the video, um, healing and restoration from the level of trauma that has happened to survivors, it is not a quick endeavor. Um, for most survivors, it will take years. Um, it will be part of their life for the, a lifetime. Um, like the individual said that even years later, there are still triggers. There are still things that come up. The difference is now that she's got coping mechanisms. She's got tools in her toolbox to combat some of those things. Um, I suggest to anybody who has an interest in the in-depth psychological, emotional, physical effects of sex trafficking to check out our website, createagainsville.com. We've got some incredible research on there um, that really talks about all of these implications and really kind of unpacks some of the myths around prostitution because sometimes people think, well, trafficking victim survivors are there by force, but an individual who's involved in prostitution, well, that's a choice. And what we really start to unpack is how false of a statement that is. Um, what ends up happening is that although that individual may not be using force, fraud, or coercion anymore, um, that person is still living under the bondage and the messages that that trafficker imparted for a length of time over and over and over again. So her trafficker may not still be a human being, but now it's in the form of shame, of um, fear, of what do I do now? I have limited education. I have a criminal record. Um, where do I turn here? And so it's really important for us to think about when we talk about the differences of sex trafficking and prostitution is to really look at the overlap instead of trying to tease them apart because nearly 100% of those who have been involved in prostitution, their entry began when they were children automatically putting in the, them into the definition, our legal definition of victims of sex trafficking. Um, so I might be working with a woman who's in her 30s, 40s, or 50s, but if her trafficking, and maybe she doesn't have a trafficker, a human trafficker anymore, but her first trafficker was at the age of five, her dad, um, that control and manipulation and trauma is still at play in her current life. And so we've got to kind of look at those things a little bit differently, like Zach was saying, and really look at the big picture and the level of care that is needed for individuals to regain dignity and purpose and health and well-being, to have the tools um, to be empowered, to gain education, to um, gain job skill development, to be able to then leave programs like Create a Gainesville or others like Wellspring Living, amazing program, and be able to be safe, to be able to acquire a job that is sustainable so there isn't that risk factor um, of poverty that is pulling her back to maybe going back into the industry just simply because there aren't as many options available. Um, so those are things that we're really passionate about. When we really start to dive into these implications, a lot of the myths that we think about around sex trafficking and sexual exploitation really start to make sense in a deeper way. We start to see how they're all tied together. And we start to, instead of just looking at where a person is in that very moment, maybe when law enforcement shows up and she's 30, um, start looking at the history and the whole story and treating her or him um, in the ways that need to be so that we're looking at the entire story. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Chief, where might our audience members come across a victim of human trafficking? Are there common locations or venues that they can keep an extra close watch on? So um, 
victims can be found anywhere at any time. Uh, uh, one thing I, I do want to say is I did bring some brochures. Uh, I'll leave them back there that outlines most all of what's being said and, and what I'm about to talk about. But uh, victims have been found in communities nationwide in agricultural, hospitality, restaurant, domestic work, any other industry, as well as prostitution, either online, on the street, or in businesses fronting prostitution like massage parlors, uh, individuals with disabilities, uh, undoc undocumented migrants, uh, runaways, homeless youth, temporary guest workers, low-income individuals are all more, more vulnerable to be taken advantage of. Um, online gaming and social media sites are haven havens for luring uh, luring victims too. So pay attention to what your uh, your kids, your neighbor kids, uh, your kids' friends are doing at your house. Uh, you know, it, it always uh, dumbfounds me. You know, I, I, I raised three kids. Thank God they they they're still out there and alive. Right, <laughs> uh, two of them ended up being firefighters. Um, but uh, you know, I would search their rooms. I'd search their cars. I'd uh, I'd go through their phones, I'd go through their computers, and, and uh, you know, I, I used to talk to other parents when they would call me and go, well, how can you tell if your kid's on drugs or if they're doing something bad? My first question to them was always, well, when's the last time you've searched their room? And their comment to me was, oh my God, I would never do that. I would never invade their privacy. Like, what privacy? You know, well, what do you do if they walk in and catch a search in the room? I look at them and go, if they ask me, what are you doing? I said, I'm searching your room. Dinner is downstairs if you want to eat, you know. So, um, but the more important thing is, is not where you can find them because you can find them anywhere is how to, how to uh, identify them or how to, you know, look for stuff that make, make you believe that they are a victim of human trafficking. Uh, one is, is that the, the person's being controlled either physically or psychologically. Uh, their inability to leave their home or their place of work uh, in a, inability to speak for themselves or share uh, one's own information. Uh, someone else is providing their information for them instead of them speaking. Uh, they don't have any uh, control over their own identification. They don't have their passport. They don't have their driver's license. Um, they have very few personal possessions. Uh, so when you're when you're dealing with people, and that's what we look for as well. When we're dealing with people, hey, can we have your identification? They don't have it. Somebody else has it. That's a pretty good indication that, that they're being a victim of human trafficking. So it's not just, it's not, like I said, it's not just where you look. It's what you look for. And anything out of the ordinary, there's a good chance they're being trafficked. Thank you, Chief. Um, so, Detective Hughes, what are some common recruitment tra tactics that traffickers use to find and, and lure children or their adult victims? What we find out is that... This kid who is in the system, had all these things, hasn't had anybody say, I love you, hasn't had anybody say, I care about you, hasn't had anybody say, I'm proud of you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm pointing to Lisa because I've seen her give speeches and why that is so important um, for us as men to tell our children we're proud of them. It is a huge thing, um, and I don't want to steal her thunder, but it's something I heard it the first time and I've never forgotten. Uh, but anyway. They take these kids that, that have these, these issues, all right? And then all of a sudden they have somebody that's older with them and they're, they're hearing things that they've never heard before. You're beautiful. I care about you. By the way, I know things are bad at home. Come stay with me. So they're going to fill, so the trafficker is going to fill the void with bad stuff. And it's going to look good on the outside, but they're going to fill that void. They're going to fill that hole with, attempt, with love, affection, and attention put them in that place where they can't have access to their phone. They can't do any of those things. And that may start with an online contact. It may start as what we would call a cold call, you know, or a cold talk. See them walking home from school with their head down. You know, any of those things, you know, they could meet on a dating website. Adults, you know, eHarmony, Plenty of Fish, bad places. You know, those are the things that occur. So it's looking for those things. And guess what? The bad guys even write books about it. And everybody laughs. Tim and Kid, 38 Rules of the Game. It's available at Walmart. And it absolutely talks about how this man exploits his victims, and it teaches other people to do it too. 
And keep in mind, that's the same guy that HBO gave millions of dollars to to do its better. Because I've heard you talk about how pornography is bad and how our kids are sexualized and all these things. Guess what? It's not just our kids. This has happened when with everybody. When HBO is paying somebody millions of dollars to go do specials in the legal brothel in Nevada, we have a problem. We're glamorizing it. When Julia Roberts gets millions of dollars for making Pretty Woman, we have a problem. Because those are the things that are sold to our kids, our women, our men, everybody. But that's how they get exploited. It's not just how the trafficker talks. It's how we respond to them as a society. It's how we respond to them as a culture. It's the foundation that we lay. That's a good point. Thank you, Detective Hughes. Um, and on, on that same vein, Congressman Yoho, how does pornography and drugs contribute to human trafficking? Can you speak to that a little? Oh, it's huge. It's like a hook. Um, once you get somebody hooked into that lifestyle, and you can say that better than I can, um, that air of dependence or that feeling of dependence, it's hard to get away from that. And what it's just hard to imagine people have such a low regard for human life that they will treat people this way because them, and they're professionals about this, they're very professional about this. And what they do is this is a source of income. They're, it's chattel for them. You know, you, you, they're just trading a human life and dignity for money for them with no regards to that person. And um, you know, when they have the, the, the drugs and the alcohol, or they don't even need that, it's the fear factor. We had a case um, when we were with DHS in one of the other countries, there was a, a supposedly a call girl that she lived on her own and her phone would ring and she had to respond wherever she was sent in the country because of the threat to her family. And this goes on around the world. So uh, the drugs and alcohol, those are the easy things. It's the threat and all those other things that keep a person indentured in this. And it is modern day slavery. And I, I see this panel has no tolerance for it and I appreciate y'all. Thank you, Congressman. Chief, what are some local efforts that are being undertaken by law enforcement to address human trafficking? Uh, all right, so I know that uh, you know my department, certainly the sheriff's office, has victim witness advocates that respond. They're uh, highly trained in identification of these uh, of these victims. Uh, they are uh, they when they show up, they offer you know comprehensive uh, care, uh, both uh, you know gender specific or culturally. Uh, uh, specific to, we have three advocates, uh, two are bilingual, and they spend a great deal of time with people trying to get them the help that they need and steer them in the, in the right direction, whether it's, uh, you know, for drug, uh, drug treatment or getting them uh, into psychological counseling or getting them out of the area to, to flee um, a, a bad situation, having uh, exit strategies so that they're, they're safe. Um, we begin our tra training for our, our new officers in orientation. Uh, this is one of the topics that we talk to them about of, of where to look, how to look, and what to do if you, you uh, believe you're dealing with a victim of human trafficking. So we start, a, we start training when they're very, very young as an officer, and that training uh, go, is continuous. We also do community training. Um, the task force that we've had has been in existence since uh, 2010. And um, we present uh, uh, training programs to professionals. And uh, we have professionals come in and speak. We have survivors that come in and speak. Um, they're free and open to the public. Some of them we hold in our community room, although we haven't been holding a whole lot of things in our community room uh, because of the pandemic. Um, but uh, like I said, they're free and, and, and anybody's welcome to come. We have a, a local multiple, multi, multidisciplinary uh, team weekly staffing at Kimberly Center. If you don't know what Kimberly Center is, it's a child, uh, what's the child advocacy center? Any victim, any child victim goes there and they get comprehensive treatment. Uh, so they, we do a, a staffing of all the cases every week. And one of the uh, things that they specifically cover is uh, human trafficking cases. Um, the thing about this is, is it, it is so fluid and, and it's so, 
ever changing that we're constantly having to change our tactics as well. But uh, we're doing, uh, we're not doing as much as we probably should, but we certainly are doing as much as we can. Thank you, Chief, um, for outlining what the local area law enforcement is, is doing in terms of human trafficking. Congressman, what are some federal level efforts to control human trafficking? I know everybody will be happy to know that this is a strong bipartisan issue. There is usually no fighting. Everybody comes together on this. And, um, you know, when we did our different summits in, in the North Florida area in our district, um, we had the state attorneys in there and they told us that it's easier to charge somebody on prostitution than it is to go after the guy for human trafficking. And so there were laws that were being tweaked. And of course, uh, I think everybody knows about the uh, website and I've got it in here, um, the law where it gave protection to those people on the internet for doing this. Those laws have been changed. Um, we, we introduced the bill, um, uh, it's called the Combat Act, which is the one I already talked about, about getting the measurements. Um, we've got one for preventing trafficking in our school act that works with DHS and the um, education department to bring this from a federal level with the money so it's not an unfunded mandate so that these programs start early on. And, and again, I commend Florida for doing that. But um, there have been multiple bills passed since I've been there uh, from the 113th Congress, which was 2013. And it's strong bipartisanship. And this is something that'll continue, I think. Uh, it's just a scourge. And it's not just here, it's around the world. And to let people know, it's not just labor, it's just not sex, it's not this. People are doing this in other countries for human parts, kidneys, livers, hearts. Uh, it goes on in other countries, the Philippines, China, and North Korea. And it's just unconscionable that here we are in the 21st century and humans are treating other humans this way. And uh, that's a huge business. And, um, you know, if anybody wants a list of the different bills we have that have are current um, or the ones that have passed within the last five years, we've got them here. And uh, if you have any questions or you know somebody going through this, reach out to our office. Our district director, Jessica Norfleet is over here, raise your hand. And um, Ed and Donna know how to get a hold of us. And, and uh, other than that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. The work is nowhere near done, but you can count on Florida Citizens Alliance to continue fighting for Florida students and the best education possible. Florida Citizens Alliance is a nonprofit 501c3 grassroots organization dedicated to educating parents, families, and community influencers regarding the horrendous state of public education in Florida. We promote parental school choice, knowledge-based learning, best standards and curriculum for K-12 students, and financial transparency. In fact, not a single person on our senior management team takes a salary. We are against religious, political, and pornographic indoctrination in our public schools. To us, it's about the students and the future of America. We have three focus areas. The first is informing parents, teachers, grandparents, anyone who will listen of the materials being taught in public schools through our marketing and social media campaigns. Our second focus is developing watchdog groups in counties across the state who consistently engage with local school boards and legislators. Our third focus is educating parents so they can take positive action to improve their child's education through state scholarship funds and other programs. 2019 was a great year for Florida Citizens Alliance and I would like to share with you some of our achievements. Because of our work, the state of Florida's back to school reading list, which previously consisted of strictly pop culture books, has now been replaced with the classics. Also, thanks to Commissioner Corcoran, the failure of Common Core has been discontinued. Florida Citizens Alliance provided the Florida Department of Education with three experts to come up with the newly announced best standards. The Department of Education also asked Florida Citizens Alliance to come up with a statewide awareness and participation in the HOPE Scholarship. The HOPE Scholarship is amazing. It gives students who have been bullied a school voucher that they can take elsewhere and find a healthy learning environment. These are just a few of our achievements and there's still a lot of work to be done. 
And I say this to you from experience as a former public school student in Collier County. We can't do this without you. My name is Dominique Clemens with Florida Citizens Alliance. Thank you.